The Tom Woods Show, episode 1997. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, it does not matter where we are in the school year, it is never too late to join the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum, which will give your kids an unfair advantage and which features 400 videos on history taught by me. And if you do decide to join the curriculum, of course, join through my link because through my link only will you get $160 worth of free bonuses. So check out my link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hey folks, Tom Woods here. Well, you may have noticed that people who hold our ideas have a bit of a problem, and that problem is persuading other people to hold our ideas. I remember standing outside a polling place in 2008. It was Alabama, where I lived at the time, and that was a state where Ron Paul got about 5% of the vote. The only honest person running, the only person telling you the truth, the only person talking about the key issues of the day, the only person talking about the Federal Reserve System, So therefore, we have to punish him. Instead, we want to be spoken to in slogans. It was horrible. But you think, that can't be right. 5%, there must be some voter suppression. No, my friends, no. I was standing outside that polling place, and I watched the people go in there, and they were going to vote for more war and more slavery if it was the last thing they did. And you can tell that because we're holding Ron Paul signs. And you know Ron Paul people. You see another Ron Paul person, you go right up to them, you practically hug them, you have a two-hour conversation about obscure books you've read. None of that happened. And it was mostly much, much older folks. Those are the ones who do most of the voting, particularly in the primaries. And they were dead set against Ron Paul. They want things just the way they are, thank you very much. And we want to be flattered and told that the only reason people around the world might dislike Americans is that they're jealous of our awesomeness. That's the level they want. And they've demonstrated that. Don't, Don't tell me I'm being uncharitable. They've demonstrated that in their voting pattern. So the old folks were a rough sell. But now we also have the problem that the young people are also hard to convince. So this is getting a little bit difficult here. That's why I want to talk today to Benjamin Williams, who has had quite a bit of success in this area. And he's been doing a lot of work over on TikTok, which is a platform I have nothing to do with at all. But it is a place where younger people can indeed be found. And we can either just sit there and let that be won by the other side, or we can engage with it. And that's exactly what he's doing. And Ben is known more commonly online as Prax Ben, P-R-A-X-B-E-N. That's how you find him on most platforms. So we're going to talk about the kind of success he's had and how he accounts for it and what strategies he's followed in order to get the message out there as effectively as he has. So Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. It's great to be here. I got to meet you at the Mises Institute Supporters Summit, and you were telling me about things you've been doing. And these are things that I don't do. I don't know how to do. I wouldn't know where to begin. Not only the message that you've tailored for a particular audience, and I don't know, maybe I'd be halfway decent at that, but I don't know. I'm getting the old man's getting up there. So I'm not sure I have that quite that connection, but also the means you're using, the media you're using to reach people. You're using them in ways that that I don't, or you're using, for example, with TikTok, I don't use that at all. So uh, first of all, a little bit of your background. You seem like a youngish guy. How did you get into all this? Yeah, so uh, a few years back, I kind of got interested in politics, mostly through the uh, election. We had like Bernie Sanders and Trump in the race, and most people thought it was, or at least most young people my age, thought it was going to come down to Bernie and Trump. And so I was very much interested in that whole race because, you know, that was going to be quite an impact if we saw someone like Bernie get into office. And so I kind of got interested in being like an anti-socialist and uh, learning more about economics. And I got into like little debates on Facebook and stuff. And then uh, shortly after that, I got onto TikTok and I wasn't really into politics on TikTok. I didn't really know that was a thing. And I started seeing these political videos, you know, like Bernie bros and Trump supporters kind of throwing their ideas out there. And it was really unusual because TikTok was like a dancing app or a lip sync app. So, you know, I was like, I wonder what this is. And I uh, started watching those videos and I saw some things from like the Bernie Sanders guys. And I was like, I don't really like some of this stuff. I think someone should 
you know, maybe rebuttal it. So I started uh, making rebuttal videos on my account and my followers didn't like it too much. I just posted like comedy videos before that. And so I guess I should make a whole political account. And I started doing that and it did very well. At that time, I was like a constitutionalist and I didn't really know a whole lot about politics, but I knew enough to just read articles and uh, learn how to refute basic things. But kind of my interest in refuting socialist better is what brought me to economics and uh, Austrian economics. I first kind of found out about it through uh, the American Enterprise Institute. Actually, the uh, music video that they made, the Marx versus Mises rap video. So uh, I think that was a very uh, good way to introduce young people to Austrian economics. And so, yeah, uh, from there, I started my journey, started reading some Mises and went from like a constitutionalist all the way to being an anarcho-capitalist. And uh, yeah, TikTok is now one of the biggest social media apps. Um, it's especially great for short video content. So I've kind of uh, used that and I grew my uh, platform on there along with the apps growth. So I saw a lot of great growth and kind of uh, exploited like the different tactics that different TikTok creators used in order to actually introduce political content to people and economics. And it worked very well. And I've seen possibly hundreds of uh, young people come to be libertarians and get interested in Austrian economics. And then, you know, from there, giving them uh, short videos, you can then introduce them to books and articles. And so, yeah, it's been really fantastic. I heard about just one video being taken down from TikTok. It was somebody reporting on some vaccine injury he had had. And there was no disputing that the testimony was accurate, but simply that this video in isolation might cause people to make poor health decisions. And so they took the video down. Is that the exception on TikTok? TikTok is a very mixed bag. It used to be very free. You could get away with almost anything on TikTok. Nowadays, it's a bit more strict. It's kind of a mixed bag because they have bots basically that regulate videos. And so if you have like a certain word or maybe if they think maybe they detect a gun or something they don't like, then the video can be uh, put under review or just taken down instantly. I do generally very well for some reason. I'm not really sure why, because I see a lot of Republican and uh, libertarian content creators being taken down. And, you know, it you can't even really say like what they're going to take down because it's just such a mixed bag. Okay, but maybe the kind of material you're dealing with is, at least for the TikTok people, considered harmless enough compared to other videos. So maybe this is not something that you're facing, but I was just wondering about that platform. Now, for people like me who, maybe I see something on TikTok because somebody sends it to me, what do we need to know? I'm not a boomer, I'm a Gen Xer, I think. I think I'm Gen X. But let's say I'm older than the, probably the typical TikTok creator, put it that way. What do we oldsters need to know about what makes it different from other platforms? Well, TikTok, uh, it's kind of like Vine that came before it. It's very short videos, but they are a bit longer than Vine. Well, they used to be one minute. Now you can go up to three minutes long. So, you know, you can have a video that's a couple of seconds long, kind of like Vine. You know, they did the uh, funny videos. Some people do dancing videos. But then you can do like, in-depth speaking videos and educational things that goes up to three minutes long. So you kind of have to learn to uh, jam all this information that might normally take you know, 15 minutes, like what you do, 30, 40-minute podcasts, try to get it into as little package as possible. So it works mostly based on algorithms. It kind of learns the type of content you like, which you know that's how a lot of social media apps work. It goes by hashtags and stuff like that. Probably one of the areas it's very weak is searching. It's very hard to search for what you're looking for. It just kind of shows you. But then you can follow people. You have a following page and the uh, regular, what they call a for you page, where it just kind of shows you what you might want to see, tries to introduce you to new content. And yeah, it's a very basic app, but it's really easy to get into. And it actually has a lot of integrated editing. So it has like uh, green screen options and... Uh, what they call video green screen. So you can kind of do a green screen on the fly without even having an actual green screen. It, it works with a sort of an algorithm to cut your person out and then it changes the background. So that's a very useful tool if you want to show like maybe an article in the background or some sort of picture, you know, you're uh, 
making some video about some political thing and you can show a whole article or a picture to like refute someone else or something like that. So it's uh, it's actually pretty simple to get into and it's really easy to make content on. Okay, so when you first started doing this, were you maybe not as polished as you are now? What was the first thing you did? Yeah, so I just kind of jumped into it, uh, just started making videos. And yeah, I definitely wasn't as good at speaking as I am now. Or, uh, you know, as good at researching. Uh, I've kind of had to learn that stuff along the way. But actually, it was a very useful tool in teaching me how to be better at public speaking. Just, you know, having to make so many videos and trying to do a better and better job. So, yeah, you just kind of have to learn along the way or take as much advice as you can from people who are used to it. Well, give me an example. Throw a video out at me and how it is that in such a short amount of time, even three minutes, still pretty short, how you're able to illustrate some important principle in a way that is effective and entertaining. I recognize that, of course, describing it is like describing how you tie a shoe. It probably seems interminable and impossible, but if you see it yourself, it's no big deal. And likewise here, I'm sure watching the video is far more pleasurable than having it described to you. But all the same, give me an example. Run me through one. Yeah, so I can give you actually two examples because they cover uh, the two uh, very important things. Number one would be maybe I'm scrolling through my For You page or maybe even someone tags me. You can tag people like you do on Facebook or Instagram. And so I get a notification. They tag me in a video by a communist, for example, and he's talking about Venezuela. And he's saying, oh, well, Venezuela isn't a socialist failure. The uh, capitalists did this. The sanctions did this. It makes all these different points. So I can go, I can save his video, and then I can go into uh, my own video creator and I can put his video where it shows it, you know, I'm kind of standing in front of it. It's sort of like a green screen. You can hear what he's saying. I'm um, showing the people, you know, his arguments. And I can go through each point. After he gets finished with a point, I can uh, go back to myself and I can say, okay, so he said uh, the sanctions are what did this to Venezuela. So let's look at maybe some research, some studies that show, you know, what was happening before and after the sanctions. So that way we can know, was it the sanctions? Well, of course not. Number two would be maybe someone's talking about capitalism and they're saying, well, capitalism fails every five to 10 years. You know, you have recessions. And then I can actually take that and be like, hey, let me tell you guys about what's called the Austrian business cycle theory and introduce Austrian theory to people. And yeah, you do have to learn to talk fast. You do have to learn how to uh, compact the information in as little time as possible. And that can be difficult for some people. But when you're doing that, you can uh, also you know, speed up videos, give people articles that they can read, stuff like that. If I'm remembering this right, looking at your phone and seeing that, did you have somewhere on the order of 170,000 subscribers? Yeah, that is correct. Okay. What do you attribute that to? And how long did that take? Uh, it took about a year and a half for the most part. I think I would attribute that to targeting Republicans, I would say. So that's what I do to get a lot of views and to get a lot of followers. I'll maybe talk about Biden, do something that Republicans want to hear, but that doesn't contradict my own views. And from that, I bring in a lot of followers. And then I can start introducing, you know, like anarchist content, libertarian content and all that stuff for them. So I think that's one of the biggest reasons I've seen so many people change to libertarians because, you know, they see something they like and they go, oh, yeah, this guy did his research on this subject and, you know, he informed me on a subject I wanted to be informed on. And now I might be a little bit interested. I might go to his uh, account, start watching his videos, or I'll see them come up. And so, yeah, uh, mostly targeting Republicans or what Gen Z really likes is seeing people get absolutely pwned. <laughs> so if someone like makes a point, they're so confident and then you come in and you're like, okay, I'm going to completely refute them. And then you just embarrass them by showing, you know, how much they were lying, uh, how ignorant they were on this subject. Gen Z really likes that. So very strong rebuttals and things like that, that really helps. Well, I guess when we think about uh, the Republican Party today, we don't associate it with young people, rightly or wrongly. So is it that there are so many people on TikTok that you'll, you'll nevertheless find some young Republicans? Or are you also doing something to reach, let's say, young people who might be politically, you know, without a home? Yeah, Gen Z is really politically active. 
I would say most of them don't really identify as Republicans or Democrats, but they do kind of align in those fields. Um, of course, they're not registered voters, uh, many of them. But yeah, the the ones who are more apolitical, that does pretty much apply to them. Because, you know, when I'm saying you're targeting Republicans, I'm just talking about, you know, you're doing very mainstream things. You're talking about the current president or the last president or talking about what is currently in the news, stuff like that. So really the uh, apolitical people and the ones who might not exactly be Republicans are very interested in that content as well. Ten years ago, I gave a talk in Los Angeles that I... Uh very proud of, where the audience was a mixed one in terms of philosophy. We had some radical libertarians and we had some, let's say, George H.W. Bush conservatives in the in the audience. It was a strange mix, but they all agreed that Obama was a bad guy and his policies were not a good idea. So I did something that's not a million miles remote from what you're doing. I started off by talking about things that would resonate with them and, and they would realize that I'm in their corner And then their resistance to what I might say on other things would be lower because they would realize I'm coming at them from a point of view of at least some shared sympathy. And by the way, when I say George H.W., but I shouldn't, I just mean they had like Operation Desert Storm hats on and stuff like that, you know, so I, I don't know really where they were coming from, but there were plenty of people who were just conventional conservatives and they loved my sense of humor and they loved the first half of my presentation. And then once I built up this capital with them, then I turned to foreign policy and I said, all right, well, you're not going to like what I have to say here, but you know, it's the same group of terrible people, basically the same regime running the foreign policy as the domestic. And they're not any more truthful about that than they are about the other thing. And you know, once they realized this was coming from a friend, well, they were not only were they willing to listen, they gave me a standing ovation at the end. So your strategy works. Yeah, exactly. And uh, especially with Gen Z, they very much latch on to influencers. So what I think and what I'd like to do in the future is really focus on that field uh, with influencers. So I actually know a lot of influencers who are much bigger than me, and maybe they're not really into politics or it's just something they talk about occasionally. So what I like to do is form relationships with them and be able to talk to them. And so, you know, they might have 100,000 followers on Instagram. And so if they actually get genuinely interested in that sort of in like economics, politics, and they align with me, then they might post something, you know, an article or something on their story just because it's something they actually enjoyed. So uh, it's very important to uh, focus on that sort of thing, have the uh, influencer status. And I think that's another reason why TikTok has been very successful as far as politics goes. Do you have any, like, let's say one particular video that just went absolutely insane in terms of views? My most viewed one would be one where I talked about Bidenomics. This was several months back. I think it might have even been before the actual election. There was a paper put out by the Hoover Institute and also something by the uh, Tax Foundation. And they were sort of predicting what would happen if we implemented Biden's tax plans and things like that. So I kind of went over those points. And, uh, you know, there was some lady and she was saying, oh, uh, if you're a right winger, what do you have to lose by voting for Biden? And so, you know, I kind of listed all these things. I'm like, here's what, you know, these certain economists are saying, what they're predicting about Biden's economy. And now we're saying maybe they weren't too far off. Folks, let's take a brief moment for me to spread some happiness. What do I mean by that? Every month, and I checked, I subscribed August 13th, 2019. So every month for two years, I have received a piece of happiness in my mailbox. And if you want to be a hit with your significant other, you will follow in my footsteps. Now, what is that bit of happiness? It is the happily date box. Every month we get a box with a different theme inside containing a music playlist and activities of all kinds and games and conversation starters that bring you closer together with your significant other. Sometimes it's competitive, sometimes it's cooperative, but it's always fun and relaxing. We've had boxes with an 80s theme, a Japan theme, a stargazing theme, all kinds of different things that help give us a special night together. Show your significant other that you value time together by checking out the Happily Date Box. And because you know all Woods, take 50% off your first date at tomwoods.com slash date. 
You know that expression, the left can't meme? Because when the left tries to meme, it's not funny. And it's half the time, it's got like a paragraph worth of text on the graphic. So it just doesn't work on any level whatsoever. And so you look at these things and all you can say to yourself is the left can't meme. But can the left TikTok? And you'd think it would be the same kind of thing, something that's short, witty, clever. Are they better at TikTok than they are at memes? Uh, Can the left TikTok? Absolutely. They are very good at it, unfortunately. Most of the biggest political creators are leftists. There's people with 250,000 followers who are not only communists, but like like tanky communists, you know, pro-Soviet, pro-China. So that's a very unfortunate thing. I think possibly some of them are kind of boosted by those who run TikTok. You know, it is, it does have direct ties to the, uh, Chinese communist government. So, you know, that's that's kind of a theory. But yeah, the thing is, what really does well on TikTok a majority of the time is really dumb content. Now, I don't like most of the time to bring myself down to making really dumb content. Sometimes I'll make, you know, uh, a political meme video or something kind of dumb, you know, just to get more people into the good content. But the leftists, they'll just make, you know, dumb content after dumb content after dumb content. And People will just believe whatever. This goes back to like the whole influencer things. They love influencers. They love to latch on to some personality. So some guy can just get up there and say whatever, and it might just go incredibly viral. Like the Venezuela video I was talking about earlier, that's a real video. And his video had like 1.3 million likes. And that's like, I don't even know, maybe 5.8 million views. And people just latch on to that stuff. So that's one of the reasons that we need like more people really fighting for the right side on TikTok. You're also on YouTube? Yeah, that's correct. My YouTube is much smaller because you know it's much uh, harder to grow on YouTube. But I haven't been doing it for too long. I kind of do very similar videos to what I do on TikTok, but you know, just have like them uh, be 30 minutes long. Why do you think it's harder to grow on YouTube? Uh, I would say... There's, number one, much more content on YouTube. You know, it's been around much longer. So you have a whole lot you're competing against. Yeah. A whole lot of uh, really long established content. What TikTok really does is it focuses on the new content. That's how the algorithm works. You usually don't see these videos on your uh, For You page that are several months old. It's usually the newest videos. Now, by the way, when we say Gen Z... I kind of know that that's youngish people, but roughly, what are we talking about? Yeah, Gen Z, I believe, is like 1995 to current day, if I'm not mistaken, generally in that category. Okay, okay. So is there any way on TikTok for a creator to hear from the audience? I mean, I suppose there are there, I suppose there must be comment threads. Is there any way to write to you and say, hey, your videos really helped me to see the world differently, stuff like that? Yeah, there's a few different ways. Number one, there are the comments. Unfortunately, you can't type very long comments. There's a uh, character limit. I think it's about 250 characters, if not mistaken. So you can't have like these long, drawn-out debates in TikTok comments very easily. But you also can enable a question and answer setting so people can ask questions or make statements towards the uh, creator. And then you can send them messages as well. And so I've been receiving hundreds of messages for the last two years, a lot of very positive things from people who were Republicans or people who were Democrats or even communists. Sometimes I may have just changed their mind on one small thing. Sometimes we see their entire political ideology change. So I do really love uh, receiving those types of messages and comments. So you're able to reach all these people on what kind of a budget? Uh, well, it doesn't cost anything to make a TikTok, so that's great. Yeah, but I mean, like, did you decide at some point, you know, I think I'll upgrade and actually get a decent camera, or I'll do X or Y. Did you ever have feel like you had to do that, or is it you just said, to heck with it, it's not going to affect the view numbers, so why bother? Well, yes and no. Uh, so I was actually already a videographer, so I did have a lot of oh. camera and recording gear, so that was a uh, very lucky thing for me. But the thing is, when you get into recording with like a nice camera and a nice mic and going in and editing yourself, it does take a lot of time. So the great thing with TikTok is I can just be in my car. I can even be at work on break and I can pop out my phone 
and I can make a great TikTok. I can make a viral TikTok educating people on some subject. So really, the fact that you can make a video so quickly is one of the great things about it. So there was some times I decided to make a video with my nicer camera to see how it would do. And it's just like, eh, I don't think it's quite worth it. Wow. See, I'm such a control freak with the stuff I put out. And not control freak, I guess more of a, something like a perfectionist. So I just don't think I could take out my phone and start stumbling over my words and looking at it. And whatever. I, I would say, no, nah, I got I to gotta go home and spend all day perfecting this thing. I don't think I'm cut out for this at all. I think you and I are exactly where we, we each need to be. Now, in an email to me, you were mentioning, but without any elaboration, so I'd like to get that from you now, what you describe as attempts by progressives and foreign governments to push Marxism on young people. Now, a lot of times people say, so-and-so is a Marxist or so-and-so is pushing Marxism. And then you look closely and it's basically like Obama-level redistribution, which is not exactly Marxism. So what exactly do you have in mind? What is going on here? Yeah, so you have uh, groups like the Gravel Institute. So they have people like Richard Wolff involved with them. And they okay, do that is outright t- Marxism. Yes. Yeah, that is outright Marxism, yeah. They're relatively big on TikTok. I think they have like 40,000 followers. And, you know, they kind of get try to get into the memes and get into the uh, rebuttal sort of thing because those, those are the things that work. You also have people like Soapbox. Now, Soapbox is a group of millennials and they make content targeted at Gen Z and millennials. And they are pretty much in the same ballpark as the Gravel Institute. They're Marxists. I would categorize them as tankies. And so Soapbox is actually directly funded by the Kremlin. And there was a uh, CNN article put out not too long ago, and it was published in a few other uh, news sites. And they found that the Kremlin propaganda was actually funding people like Soapbox. And there's several other groups that I can't quite remember the name of, which are also kind of in that same ballpark. And they do have TikToks and they really push this stuff on Gen Z people hard. They push, you know, like, oh, Venezuela actually isn't that bad. Cuba actually isn't that bad. You know, during the whole Cuba protest situation, they were claiming most of the protesters were pro-communism and that the uh, anti-communists were being paid off by the CIA, stuff like that. And uh, they also really strongly push uh, things on foreign policy. Now, I might agree with Marxists on foreign policy to an extent. But when they're pushing like the really strong anti-American government stuff, while they're being funded by people like Russia or people like China, then you know, you know, they're just trying to cover up uh, the things done by their own governments and try to make the American government seem much worse than Russia or China. Back uh, when you were probably but a a mere lad at the uh, beginning of the first of the Ron Paul presidential campaigns in the Republican Party back in 2007 and eight. I started to get more and more video views because I would make videos defending Dr. Paul against various attacks. And there was no shortage of such attacks. I think there'd be a ridiculous article in Slate or Salon or wherever. And the articles would all take the form of, oh my goodness, look, he thinks this and he thinks that. There's no re- attempt to refute any of these things. It was just, oh, I can't believe he said this, he said that. And so I would make a video saying, yeah, of course he said this and that because that happens to be correct and here's why. And so I got into the habit of doing this and people would watch those videos because they also wanted to see Dr. Paul's enemies smack down. So I found that what tended to get a lot of attention were rebuttals, not so much videos I would make purely from scratch of original content, but rather responses to bad people that everyone wanted to see smashed, and then I would do the smashing. So how does that go with you? I mean, I'm sure some of what you do is also rebuttals. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Rebuttals is my favorite thing to do. Most of the time I'm doing a rebuttal, either refuting something that's already been said, that's commonly said. But what really gets views and what really gets people noticing is if you rebuttal a particular person, you know, another uh, TikTok creator, especially someone who's like very well established, Sometimes it's not even like the uh, communist creators, you know, the people who are on the daily making communist content. Sometimes it is some random creator. Maybe they just do dance videos, comedy videos, and then they're like, hey, I'm going to talk about politics today. I'm going to make some dumb statement about capitalism or socialism or whatever. 
And if you uh, make a rebuttal to those people, then the uh, viewers tend to take notice. And yeah, you're absolutely right. People absolutely love seeing people uh, absolutely smash. They love seeing rebuttals. And I think what Gen Z really likes seeing, especially in rebuttals, which uh, some Austrians may find difficult to hear, is they love seeing empirical evidence. You know, obviously, Austrians are totally okay with empirical evidence, but they tend to focus on the theoretical side. But I like to introduce people to empirical evidence and to uh, historical evidence and then kind of get them into theory afterwards, because it's very difficult to just introduce someone in Gen Z to theory straight out of the book. Yeah, well, not not only that, I think even with anybody, if you immediately go into professor mode, well, who, first of all, who the heck are you? And I don't particularly feel like being a student at your feet, especially when I'm on a platform that has a zillion funny things I can watch. So I don't think it's practical even to try it that way. Yeah, exactly. So now, one other thing you were mentioning, I'm always interested in the up-and-coming people in the movement because without them, the thing fizzles out. You know, when when Rothbard wrote Man, Economy, and State in 1962, there was a real possibility of the Austrian school actually fizzling out. And we consider this an impossibility today because we have so many people as part of it and so many academics and so much work being done, but that was a very real possibility. So I'm very always very interested, do we have good, talented people coming up? Now, again, TikTok is not where scholarship is done, but it is, in theory at least, where you can reach people for the first time, get them thinking, and before you know it, I mean, for example, some people read my book, Meltdown, about the financial crisis of 2008. It's a short little book. And I've had people say, come up to me and say, I decided to major in economics because I read your book. Just that one little experience sitting down with something I did changed the way they looked at the world. So what can you say from your vantage point about what we might call the future of the Gen Z Austro-Libertarians? Oh, yeah. So I think it's definitely uh, something we should be very optimistic about. I know a lot of really intelligent uh, young Austrians, and you'll see these people who, you know, they're, they're already very intelligent, and then you kind of introduce them into libertarianism and then into, into economics, and then, you know, they're already, they're already smart, and so they really latch on to these things and become very intelligent in economics and in philosophy. Like, for example, Back when I was a constitutionalist and I did sort of, you know, Republican leaning content, I met this guy. uh, He was like maybe 13, 14 at the time. And his name is Craig and he was from Scotland. And, you know, he saw this political content I was making and he got interested in it and he started talking to me. And he was really smart and he was really into quantum physics and not as much into politics. But, you know, we kind of talked about politics a lot and he was really uh, getting into it. And then he kind of went on that journey with me and becoming a libertarian. And now he is way smarter than me on anything economics related. He is uh, currently writing a book on Marxism, and he's working on that with uh, Walter Block, who, you know, he's a uh, fellow at the Mises Institute. He's a PhD economist. You know, he's a great guy, a very intelligent guy himself. And so, you know, it's just great seeing this guy who's, uh, I, I believe he's 15 or 16 now, working on this book with someone like Walter Block. Yeah, that's an amazing thing. (laughs) That is really great. I love to hear stuff like that. I'll put links to your content on these uh, different platforms at tomwoods.com slash 1997. Is there a quick way people can find you? I guess, do they use, if they type in Prax Ben, do they get taken to your stuff? Uh, yeah, if you uh, just Google Praxben, P-R-A-X-B-E-N, then uh, it will direct you to my social media. You've got TikTok and YouTube. I also have an Instagram that I like to post memes and stuff on. So it's, it is pretty easy to find me, yeah. Okay, so we've got that. And again, I'll have this stuff up at tomwoods.com slash 1997. Given that this is your area rather than mine, is there anything I missed that we should have covered? Yeah, I think uh, just to further that last point, we should definitely be very optimistic about this younger generation. But we also really need to focus on uh, seeing more people come down that libertarian path. I would definitely love to see a lot more of these young people, you know, like the people going to Mises Hue, 
making their own online content and you know the people who are being converted over working on that sort of thing not only craig the uh scottish guy but a lot more people we actually formed a group called volunteers haven where we have a lot of really intelligent young Austrians and uh, they have a podcast that they work on. They've had people like Walter Block on the podcast and it's just really excellent. I, th- I think if we really focus on Gen Z in the Austro-Libertarian movement, we'll see a lot of great things coming forward. Well, I'm always happy to hear good news, especially nowadays. So I appreciate that and the work that you're doing and sharing it with us. I suppose there will be some people who may think to themselves, well, that sounds like something I can do. And of course, the more the merrier. We we need to get our voices out there with every platform at our disposal. So let's go ahead and do that and following in your important footsteps. So tomwoods.com slash 1997 is where the links can be found. And Ben, thanks for your time today. Absolutely, and thank you. All right, everybody, let me remind you in case you haven't gotten the uh, message here, listening to the Tom Woods show is but the tip of the iceberg. You got to get the newsletter. That's where the action is. And the newsletter don't cost you nothing. And in fact, I even give you something free to entice you to get my free newsletter. I mean, it's completely lopsided. The nature of the relationship here, totally lopsided in your favor. So I recommend an ebook I released. Of course, it's an ebook. What else would it be? Not too long ago, but that makes a very important point regardless of the time period. It's called COVID Charts CNN Forgot. You get the idea that these are charts that really can't be explained by the standard narrative that you got to stay in your house or wear a mask, whatever. These charts just don't work with that narrative. And therefore, the narrative must be false because the charts are reality. So I think it's a pretty useful little resource. So if you pick it up, you also get my newsletter. Now, if you hate my newsletter with one click, you never have to hear from me again. But I just don't believe that's going to happen. No siree. You're going to get that newsletter and say, how was I surviving without this free newsletter from Old Woods? So how do you get this nice package, the ebook and the newsletter? Well, you go to chartstheyforgot.com. That's how you do it. Chartstheyforgot.com will get you on there nice and quick, and you're just going to love it. And plus, it's, it's going to make Old Woods here happy. And that's I don't ask for a whole lot here on the Tom Woods Show. I give away a free show every day. I ask for this one thing, hop on the mailing list. And I know you're thinking, but Woods, I get a lot of email already. Yeah, well, delete those because you're going to like the Tom Woods letter, okay? Delete what you have to delete in order to make room for it. Anyway, chartstayforgot.com, that's the website. Go do what you got to do there, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.